Well, welcome everyone to the Member Summit recap. Uh, we had our Member Summit a couple weeks ago. It was a smashing success, if I do say so myself. And uh, today we're going to kind of do a, a brief overview of the topics that were covered, some of the outputs and outcomes from the different discussions that took place, and uh, talk about upcoming events. So my name is Matt Seaman. I'm the executive director of the Consortium for Service Innovation. We are a not-for-profit industry alliance made up of member companies, really focusing on innovative ways to improve engagement. And I think it was apparent at Member Summit that we've moved beyond talking about customer engagement since there were a lot of discussions about coaching and interaction between people within a company, not just a relationship external to a company. And I would say our work is, is definitely moving beyond simply talking about how do we engage our customers or make customers successful, but how do we make our entire organization a success? We have a great group of member companies, uh, great representation at Member Summit of all of our different member companies and non-member companies as well. This is our sponsor and benefactor members. All of the work of the consortium is funded by the membership and the annual membership dues that people are willing to pay to be a part of this organization. So big thank you to our 70 brave member companies that make all of this possible. We also got to welcome a lot of new companies to the consortium at the member summit. In the last 15 months, we've had some great new companies join. We've also had some companies come back that had left the consortium and come back to the consortium like ConnectWise and Nokia, um, all of which are doing really new and exciting things. It's great to welcome new people into the community to bring different perspectives, different learnings, different experiences. So big, big welcome to all of our new member companies as well. And it really is the network of thoughtful and energizing people that make all of the work possible. There are only six people on the staff of the consortium. We have the honor of shepherding the work and making connections between people that have like interests or are pursuing innovative things. But it really is all of the members that make the work possible. And that was a very apparent at Member Summit with all of the discussions that were taking place and the connections that were being made. At Member Summit, we kind of went with the theme of let's get analog. There is so much talk about digital automation, digital transformation, wherever other buzzwords you want to put after digital um, with chat GPT and self-service. It really is a digital world that we're living in, but we were together in person. So we wanted to make sure that we were focused on interaction and building relationships between people. So we went with the theme of let's get analog. We had post-it notes on the table that people could write takeaways and post on the walls. We actually had open space notes written on paper, which was uh, fun to see again and trying to read people's handwriting. So it was uh, truly uh, an experience to have everybody together. And we really focused in on this concept of building shared stories and our connections as humans are nurtured and connected to the fact that we have shared story. And being together in person, it was about what story could we create? How could we create new stories? What stories could we continue? And while we had an amazing agenda of hosts who helped bring different discussions and topics forward, as always, the great discussions happened over Cocktails at the welcome reception, over dinner, during the breaks, um, seeing all the smiling faces, hearing all the laughter in the hallways as we were dodging the rain. Going to San Diego was the idea that we could do everything outside. The first day was beautiful, and then we had to battle some bad weather. So it also was nice to see people kind of coming together to deal with the elements and getting umbrellas from our rooms, getting umbrellas from the front desk to help people get from location to location. But we really did come together and create a lot of new shared stories that will keep this group of people connected and moving the works forward. 
one of the things I'll try and uh, highlight as we go through the recap is how many discussions are already scheduled as follow-ups to things that took place at Member Summit, topics that are ongoing and the bodies of work that are ongoing from Member Summit. So we had a great time, created a lot of new stories, met a lot of new people. It was the first time we've been back together at a Member Summit since 2019, which is hard to believe. Lots of new faces, lots of new people. So it was great to see some old friends and get to meet and uh, make connections with new friends. So thank you to everybody who attended. It was really um, a fun, energizing, exciting event to be back in person and getting to share stories over some tacos and shrimp and bacon. We had lots of bacon every day. As we were thinking about our shared story, we kicked off the member summit talking about how the community builds a shared story and where all of the new ideas come from that we get to explore from open space sessions, hallway discussions, um, consortium conversations, member companies bringing a new idea, iterations on ideas. We have many, many ideas to explore and some of those ideas don't stick. Some of those ideas might be a one-off discussion between two people, and that's fantastic, but they just aren't really something that the rest of the membership wants to pick up and continue talking about. But some of those ideas do start to move forward, and a brave member will pick up an idea and say, you know, that's not so crazy. I'm going to go try that. I'm going to go play around with that and test it. Then they bring back into the organization. They bring it back into the uh, open space sessions, or they bring it back into a team meeting and talk about what they've learned, the experiences they've had, and another member may pick it up and start to iterate on it. So we have these ideas that start to get iterated on over and over. Some get iterated on quickly, some take years to iterate on. Some of the uh, things that get iterated on, the time isn't right. We've got lots of examples of things that start to get worked on, maybe worked on for six months, and then kind of nobody really talks about it for a while, and then they pop back up. I think intelligent swarming is a decent example of that. The consortium has been talking about intelligent swarming for well over 10 years, but now the tools, the technologies, and the environment is ripe for it to really be something that people are turning into operational experiences. So as we iterate on these ideas, some of them move forward to become operational experiences, get documented in practices like KCS, like intelligence swarming. As people learn from those operational experiences, though, this sparks more iteration. None of the methodologies, none of the work of the consortium is ever stagnant. KCS, by far the most documented, the most prescriptive model that we have is still being iterated on, still being changed, still being updated. That's why you will rarely hear us talk about best practices around things, because once somebody thinks they have the best practice, somebody else will iterate on it and come up with a new idea. As we iterate, new ideas get sparked, and we really have a loop of ideas, member iteration, operational experiences, which then feed back into more iterations and more ideas. And this is how we build our shared stories as a consortium. When we look back over the last four years, the amount of stories that we've created, documented, and put on paper is pretty impressive. Whether you're talking about updates to KCS, all the work around nurturing an adaptive workforce, the principles for an adaptive organization, these are all things that have been captured member experiences that are documented and available in the uh, digital library. While these kind of represent the outcome of the work of people, there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of member discussions behind all of these things. The recent field guide for KCS program management is a great example where a set of member companies that are KCS program managers started just asking questions and saying, what would I like to have known when I first started out that I know now? They came together, had discussions. Uh, then we got together with them in Denver. Sarah and Kelly spent three days in a room with the program managers, 
working with them to capture their experiences, capture the things that they knew and created a document that is continuing to be iterated on and has also now matured into a new body of work around handling doubts and objections, which was one of the sessions at Member Summit. So the work is never static, always moving, always being iterated on, but there is a lot of new bodies of work that are available for members and non-members in the digital library. As we continued in day one, after talking about how stories get created, we heard from Brad Smith on really a story about how the work gets done. And this was a great example of member collaboration plus chat GPT creating an entire new body of work. And what's interesting about this story is it's rapidly developed work, but really highlights how consortium members come together. At the 2022 member summit, which was only in September, so it was not that long ago, one of the open space topics was on coaching managers. And from that open space topic, the team decided that they wanted to have a follow-up discussion. So in January, we had a consortium conversation, which is a one or a two hour meeting that people come and maybe scope a topic or talk about a topic. So in January, a team of people came together on scoping the conversation around coaching for transformation. That conversation led to a virtual two-day team meeting on connecting the dots on coaching. And from that, an empathy map was created. And I'll talk a little bit about the empathy map and how that was used. Then in March, the team got back together for connecting the dots on coaching part two, where the team leveraged chat GPT to build out kind of contextual information based on what the members talked about. And then Brad presented this at the member summit. And in April, there is a follow-up to go super deep into what was done with the empathy mapping and how uh, Brad used chat GPT to pull information out of all the experiences of the members. So what Brad did, he hosted a session on building an empathy map across four personas, a knowledge worker, a coach, a manager, and an executive, and had the experiences, perspectives, and knowledge of 39 people from 21 different member companies create what are the gains, the tasks, and the pains that are faced by these four different personas. All of that information and data that was captured from all of those different people was then put into and used to train chat GPT. And from that, Brad asked chat GPT questions. Uh, and what he will go through in his session in April is really deep into all of the different things that were created by it. This is just a, a summation. But asked, what are kind of the key themes of the following statements? So asking chat GPT, what are the common tasks? What are the common gains? And what are the common pains across all four of these personas? And the output is pretty interesting because I think if you're in services, these things make sense to you. So the common tasks across all of these different personas is that we have to do customer service, we have to do knowledge management, and we have to work as a team and collaborate across the organization. The gains that I get across all these different personas is I'm, I care about professional development, I wanna be in a collaborative team-based environment, and I care about customer success. And the pains are lack of support and resources, conflicting priorities and interpersonal di dynamics. So a super interesting model that within six, seven months, members came together, we captured all of this great information from people's experiences, leveraged chat GPT to start to create some contextual outputs, all based on though, what people already know. Kind of interesting because chat GPT is not magic. It is just some algorithms you have to train it. So it, we had to kind of get all those experiences from people for chat GPT to give us the contextual output. So a great example of how members came together and how we can leverage technologies to speed up creating things. Uh, when we look at all the things that were created using chat GPT, when you read it, 
it is absolutely something that would have been written by the consortium membership, but it probably would take a month of iteration to get it to be written in the way that ChatGPT output it in a few iterations by Brad. And like I said, on April 20th, Brad's going to do a deep dive into all of the different contexts, all of the different things that have been created. There's um, for every single persona, there's lists of pains, gains, and tasks. There's a job model that was created. If you're going to hire somebody into a knowledge worker role, what are the things that that job model would look like? And also, Chat GPT said before hiring people, you maybe need to fix some of the things that uh, appear to be broken with your pain. So it's kind of funny the way Chat GPT said maybe before you hire people, you should fix some of the things going on in your organizations. But a great follow up conversation coming from Brad. As we continued on day one of the summit, we had our guest speaker, Kevin Clark from Content Evolution, talking about sense mapping, which is a way to think about designing your product systems, services that are fully human capable. So as we continue in this digital world, how do we make sure we're designing things to be about humans and how humans can interact with these technologies? Uh, so Kevin talked a little bit about a model for sense mapping that can be uh, leveraged to think through designing for human uh, capability. But one of the things that really rung true with a lot of the members and was a kind of a continuing theme for the rest of Member Summit was this idea that we move from survival to success to significance. Say that five times really super fast. Um, but no longer are people satisfied with just being successful. People really want to feel that they are doing something significant. And some of the research is showing that, especially the younger generations, they really want to reach significance faster, where the older generations felt like, I had to get into the workforce, I had to survive for a few years to you know, start to become a professional and then I get to be successful because I'm making more money, I've got a higher title, and then I can finally move to significance. The newer workforce and the newer generations are saying, success isn't necessarily the end goal. I actually wanna feel significant and I wanna be contributing, which fits very well with what we talk about around Daniel Pink's um, motivators of what is my purpose. And I want to make sure that I'm connected to the purpose of my company and the things I'm doing have more to offer than just success for myself. So it was kind of a theme that then started to percolate through the rest of the member summit. In the afternoon, we had breakout sessions. Um, so people could choose which breakout session they wanted to attend. Our breakout sessions one and two were um, hosted by Monique Cadena and Larry Yang from Ping Identity on Intelligent Swarming. And the other one was hosted by Bonnie Chase and Daniel Dell from Caveo on a blueprint for a successful portal renovation. Ping Identity presented at the 2022 Member Summit on the successes they were seeing early in Intelligent Swarming. So Monique and Larry gave an update on the continued success they're seeing and the things that are helping them sustain success. And it was all about people. So in their ability to sustain success, it wasn't about getting tool updates or making the tools easier. It was really about people and understanding that your design will have to evolve and change. So the processes you're using, the way you're getting people engaged will evolve and change. And that you really need to start recognizing the contributions that people make for any of the work, which is what we talk about a lot in the recognize. So what are all the things people do to contribute to success, not just how many cases are they closing? And now career progression is shifting and is now tied to all of the work that creates value and maybe not some of the traditional models or thinking about my career progression is moving from a tier one to a tier two or a tier three. And that the IS core concepts, the intelligence swarming core concepts are non-negotiable. They are a baseline that you have to use in order to think through your design and make sure that you're designing around those core concepts. Um, so really great success at Ping. 
they're still facing some challenges. Monique all, and Larry also talked about some of the challenges that they're still facing, the areas they still need to work on, but it is an evolving, uh, never ending design that they're going through, but they continue to see great success and faster time to resolutions, faster first responses, all of the kind of the traditional metrics are still looking really good in their intelligence forming model. Then in the second session, uh, we heard from Bonnie Chase and Daniel Dell on thinking through what it takes to do a successful portal renovation, although I would say maybe not even a renovation, just the way to think about it in terms of designing it the first time or sustaining it. But they went through kind of the key, I'd say key four steps that it takes to do a um, think through how to make your portal successful. And they included some templates for personas and for journeys. So there's actually some templates that can be used by people to help structure how they think through this. You really need to consider the multiple intents of different people. There isn't one person coming into your portal. There isn't one reason somebody's creating content. There's all kinds of different intents. You have to think through all of that. And don't start thinking about how you add AI to the equation until you've thought through steps one through four. So don't start going, oh, I just need to put some sort of machine learning in place, or I need a chatbot, or I need some AI in place. Think through everything else. Think through your customer. Think through your content. Think through your requirements. Think through your experience before you just apply an AI. But again, what I found interesting about the discussion is success was rooted in thinking about it from a human perspective. So a human-centered design approach instead of it being a technology approach which is connecting to what Brad talked about, connects to what Monique talked about, connects to what Kevin Clark talked about. So this, this idea of a human being the center of everything continued to get pulled through all of the different sessions. In session, um, oh, ongoing. So we already have some ongoing activities based on these two sessions that took place. For intelligence warming, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, there's the Intelligence Warming Practices Guide, and we have the Fundamentals Course and Certification. There was a lot of discussion about how does intelligence warming work? What do you have to think through? And a lot of it is documented in the Practices Guide and covered in the Fundamentals Course. So they're, they're really great resources that people should be uh, taking a look at if you're thinking about intelligence warming. We're also gonna be starting a intelligence warming working group which is really for members that are actively implementing intelligence warming to start looking at and going deep into how are we attacking connect, how are we attacking collaborate, and how are we thinking about recognize. So we're gonna be pulling together uh, member companies that are actively in the process of implementing IS to continue to iterate on the methodology. And to talk more about thinking through successful portals and how we engage our customers or anybody that's looking to interact with our knowledge, we have a team meeting in June on next gen knowledge sharing. So two great ways to continue the discussion on these topics. In breakout sessions three and four, uh, we had, I don't have time, so handling doubts and objections. This is a common theme in every single meeting I'd say that we have, but how do I get the time? How do I handle the doubts and the objections that I hear from executives or from knowledge workers or from middle management, from anybody when thinking about implementing really anything, but this is focused on KCS. It was hosted by Janine Deegan, Adam Hansen, Kristen Hunter, and Jacob Watts who were all involved in the uh, KCS field guide for program management. So they are four of the key players that helped build that document. And then KCS is just an acronym, Distilling the KCS Practices Guide with Jennifer Crippen and Tamara Umlung. Unfortunately, Tamara couldn't be at Member Summit because of some flight cancellations and flight delays. So we absolutely missed her there. But she's been instrumental in that body of work and will continue to be instrumental in that body of work. For the I don't have time, I think a big part of that thinking is around our coaching skills and leveraging all of these skills we have to be a good coach and how do we influence 
Um, so the listening inquiry, reflection, appreciation, advocacy, a lot of the stuff that has been developed by Dr. Beth Haggett around coaching skills. And in the library is the document on how to handle doubts and misconceptions. So it's got a list of what are the doubts that we hear? What are the responses? How do we think about them? How do we talk about them? A great resource. I would highly recommend and going to read it. Because even though it is a little bit more focused on um, maybe KCS, it really is kind of universal when you think about some of the doubts and misconceptions that we hear. And on KCS is just an acronym. Uh, this started with a, it was a team meeting that we had focused mainly uh, in Europe. So the timing was more for a European audience. But the idea was, if how do you do KCS in a small environment? And I forget who, but somebody made the statement, well, how do you do KCS with no staff, no funding, no time, and bad tools? And when we hear from member companies, a lot of times we're hearing about kind of big, broad, super successful, or you know, large companies are implementing KCS. But KCS is used by you know, companies that maybe have four or five people in support or four or five people doing KCS. So in an environment like that, how do we think about KCS? Um, so again, being led a little bit by Jennifer Crippen and Tamara Umlung, but we've captured kind of baseline statements around the eight practices and really boil those down to the why. So why are these things important? Again, based on 22 different people from 15 member companies coming together to share their experiences, and building a document that is kind of a, a great overview of KCS and why it's important to think through the different practices, as opposed to reading about all of the things that you might have to think about in capture and structure or performance assessments, but kind of what do they mean and why are they important? And this is captured in the digital library. There is a follow-up discussion to this happening in May, being hosted by um, Jennifer and Tamara. So this conversation will continue as this uh, body of work kind of continues to be refined and worked on. But uh, a great discussion and uh, I think a powerful body of work for people to get a better sense of the why of the eight practices before deep diving into the specifics of all eight practices. We ended day one with a conversation between Jeff Elzer from Oracle and Christina Rosen from Akamai on what could AI-assisted knowledge work look like in the future. Um, it was, I'd say an eye-opening discussion. Um, Christina kind of hosted Jeff and Jeff kind of answered people's questions in the audience and gave perspectives on where is AI going how is it being used? What's the hype versus the reality? What are the things to think through? And, you know, I think uh, a couple of the key takeaways that I got from Jeff and Christina are, one, the technology is moving faster and faster by the day. And so the things that we think are impressive today are not gonna seem impressive in six months. Make sure you understand and have use cases for what you're trying to do. Um, everybody today is talking about how do I use chat GPT? How do I use chat GPT? And as Jeff pointed out, chat GPT has a great use case, but it doesn't, it is not the end all of every single possibility of where you could use AI or machine learning within your organization. So really think through what are the use cases you're trying to accomplish? What are the security concerns you have? Can you use an open source or does it all need to be, be behind your firewall? How are you going to train the AI? being cautious about training the AI because as you have AI generated content, that content is then used to train AI. So you end up with this loop going on. So all kinds of great tips and techniques from, from the discussion. And it was a great way to kind of end the day before having a short break and coming back together for our uh, cocktail reception and dinner where we uh, just continued lots of great discussions. So that was that was day one. And day two, still the fan favorite, is open space. We had an entire day of open space. We had 24 topics that were explored. 
across four different times, many different rooms. Uh, I'd say everybody, you know, kind of reacted well. It was really rainy that morning. So our outdoor spaces couldn't be used. We found new spaces to use. And um, it was, it turned out to be a kind of a fun day and a fun experience because of the weather, but really lots of different topics. Um, and as I walked around, there were topics left on table. So there were far more than 24 topics that we could have explored, but these were the 24 that the people in the room decided to talk about. So we had uh, lots of great notes taken and handwritten notes taken again. So these are some of the images and pictures of the different notes that were taken by people. Um, in the Member Summit Wiki page is links to all of the notes from the different sessions. Some of the notes are more in depth and more detailed than others, um, but all of the notes are captured. And some of the open space topics were fairly new topics, things we haven't explored before. Some were um, iterations on themes that have already been explored. And we had quite a few follow-up sessions and things being scheduled based on these open space. Open space is definitely one of the areas where we get a lot of the new ideas that members might start to iterate on that eventually turn into things. So open space is definitely one of the main ways that we kind of generate new ideas based on having all these people together talking and interacting. So based on open space, there's at least four things already scheduled uh, or being scheduled. One of the open space sessions was capture versus create. Can we be more explicit on the difference between these two things? And Jennifer Crippen is going to be hosting some follow-up discussions. So we're working right now on getting that scheduled and organized. Coaching for leadership, uh, follow-up being organized by David Kay. And this isn't about necessarily how do you get leadership to buy into the fact that we need coaching. It is how do we actually provide coaching to managers and leaders? What are the cultural changes that have to take place? What are the things that we need to coach on? So it really is about coaching our managers and our leaders, not getting them to buy in that coaching is important. I mentioned already uh, intelligent swarming and setting up a working group. Uh, the working group so far will consist of Akamai, Ping, Identity, Nokia, Motorola, Salesforce, F5, and the DTCC. These are all organizations that are actively in the process of implementing intelligence swarming. So we'll be pulling that working group together. If you are in the process of implementing intelligence swarming and would like to be a part of the working group, please reach out to myself directly, or you can reach out to Jennifer through the help uh, at serviceinnovation.org. Uh, and we'll get you involved in that group as we get it set up. AI and automation was sprinkled throughout open space. Um, and we will continue to explore that topic at a team meeting coming up at the end of April. Um, on you know kind of ai and automation for customer engagement we'll refresh the predictive customer engagement the double loop model that was created to think about how you would apply machine learning not specifically what machine learning but how you would apply it so that should be a, a great discussion with uh, some leaders and people that are doing cutting edge thing but also exploring what are some of the use cases that we may want to have uh, so again I'm always amazed at the energy on open space day, even after an entire day of everybody talking to each other and exploring ideas during the readout, everybody continued to talk that evening people continued to talk. It really is amazing the energy that is generated when people are given the opportunity to explore ideas together. So we will absolutely continue open space for, uh, for our member summits as a, a kind of key way to bring people together. On the last day, um, we kicked the day off with Kendall and Laurel talking about beyond leadership. So practicing good judgment and leveraging the leadership and adaptive organization work. It was one of my favorite presentations at the event because it really was exploring where we can go with leadership and where we can go with an adaptive organization but also showing the journey that F5 has been on and the results that they're seeing based on 
really doubling down on coaching and thinking about leadership and thinking about how to be adaptive. So not only was it talking about some of the methodologies that members have been working on, but they really are able to now attach some of these things to outcomes. And Kendall talked about the impact that coaching is having on getting to those quantifiable impacts and that you need to focus on the heart and show people their impact. So it isn't just about a process. It isn't just about we need to do X, Y, Z. It's about getting people engaged, changing the culture, and having it be something that people see as this is how we get the work done. And then some of the measurable impacts around their customer sat when you have a coach involved, when you don't have a coach involved, and really nice to see somebody attaching some real outcomes. Uh, so I would encourage you to go look at the presentation in the members wiki. It's full of great information. But thinking through that culture change and how long it takes, right? Culture change it takes time and it takes patience. And you may not see that there's a culture change until you go through time and then go back and reflect on the journey you've been on. F5 has been on a multi-year journey. And now reflecting back, they can see that the culture has changed. They can see how people are embracing things in a new and different way. And it really becomes about investing in your people. And this is how you can achieve success is by investing in people first. Uh, and they, they did a great job of playing off some of the kind of phrases that are used across the consortium and that KCS is the way we solve problems, but leadership becomes the way we influence and guide our teams. Um, so really thinking about how do you build a culture of leadership that is focused on making your team successful, a really great presentation. And we surprised Kendall with being recognized as the latest consortium innovator for all of his ongoing contributions to the work of the consortium for the benefit of the community. He is always opting in in the Slack workspace to help people with his perspectives, but also ask interesting questions. He has been a part of the KCS field guide uh, creation handling doubts and objections, is a host of the Salesforce community of practice. So really just is always willing to jump in and really contribute to the bodies of work and is one of the key players at F5 that is leveraging the work of the consortium membership to make change and test things and put them into practice. So it was very exciting to welcome Kendall to the innovator family and to surprise him with, uh, with that recognition. So congratulations to Kendall again, and uh, super excited that when he's on a Zoom now, you can see his thinker statue up on the shelf behind him. So great to have him uh, continue to be a huge contributor to the consortium and share his experiences. We ended the day with the um, panel interview with Nicole James from Oracle, Andrew Wilson from ConnectWise, and Paula Boucher from Akamai on things that executives and leaders have to think about when making decisions on priorities as an executive sponsor. And we heard from the pressures or the challenges that they face when trying to make those decisions based on the executives at their company, what are the priorities of the company, what are the budget constraints they have, so how do they have to manage kind of up the chain on the things that they think are a priority as well as what are the things that the people in their teams can do to help them make the right decisions, prioritize things. We don't have unlimited budgets. We don't have unlimited resources. So how do we make some of those challenging discussions and decisions? And there were some just great tips in there. Uh, Nicole made uh, something that seemed to resonate with people that don't come to me with a great idea unless you've talked to the customer. So Nicole is um, more focused on product and services, but I think that statement rings true for anything. Don't come to me with a great idea unless you've talked to the people that are doing the job. Don't talk to me about a great idea unless you've talked to the customers. Like, what are these things and how do we balance them and where do we get the information from? So it was a really interesting discussion, a great way to kind of end the summit by hearing about all of the things we talked about during the week, are all great ideas. They're all things we would love to do every day, but what are the things we can do to empower our executives and our leaders 
to make the decisions on where the funding should come from, what should be the priorities and how we move all these things forward. Uh, one of the discussions we're having with leaders across companies right now is how do you keep that long-term vision through these short-term economic disruptions? And a lot of the tips and techniques and the things that Nicole and Andrew and Paula talked about really are about how do you keep that focus during these times of economic disruption? I can't say enough great things about all of the hosts of the different sessions from day one and day three, um, the people that hosted the breakout sessions and the 24 amazing people that hosted open space and you know proposed ideas and then hosted rooms. So really was made possible by all of these people and everybody who showed up that really, I'd say dove in um, you know, we're part of the experience, we're present, we're listening, we're building on each other's stories, and we, we really created some great new stories and things that we will continue to work on moving forward. And again, we've got a lot of great new uh, things being posted to the events area of the consortium website. So the way that all this work gets done is by people staying engaged. Uh, and so we have both member only and public events coming up, whether it's with Brad Smith on the empathy mapping, AI and automation for customer engagement. We have a KCS in action, change management and KCS in a digital first world, which is uh, something I'm, I'm very interested in as change management is a big part of making anything successful. And then the ongoing distilling the KCS V6 adoption and transformation guide. There's lots of stuff listed on the website though. We have a lot of events um, going out pretty far at this point. So go, definitely go check that out and mark those off in your calendar, register for them so you get the invites. Um, and we definitely hope to see everybody at those, those events. Really, we need to kind of keep creating our stories together. That's how all of this works. It's what makes it so fun is sharing, learning, being a part of a high trust environment and being back in person was really energizing and I really appreciated how everybody showed up and the great discussions that I had, all the new people that I met, all the new connections that were made. And stay tuned as we are really working now on the 2024 member summit. Hard to believe that we're two weeks after the 2023 member summit and we're already starting to work with venues on 2024, but stay tuned for the 2024 member summit and the location that that will be at. And we will continue to do a lot of virtual events as we go through the year. So again, keep paying attention to those things so we can kind of keep creating stories together.